Hello students, welcome once again to our course on Applied Environmental Microbiology. Today I am going to talk about what is referred to as the central dogma of microbiology. So up till now we have talked about the cell structure, how it is made, what are its components and had a brief glance at their functions and properties. And I ended the previous lecture talking about genes, introducing you to genetic elements and even hinting about the idea of chromosome and extra chromosomal genetic material. Today we are going to dive deeper into the informational molecules such as genes, DNA, nucleic acids in the cell and notice how they regulate life. And this involves three steps, first is replication, second is transcription and third is translation. And this together are known as central dogma of molecular biology. So today we are going to learn about uh, first gene, genetic elements and genome. This is from the last lecture. So just as a revision, gene are, are those fragments of nucleic acids that together make sense. They together code for a command. Genetic elements are all the genes and non-genetic um, non-gene genetic material together that are uh, clustered together such as chromosome or plasmid and genome is all genetic material in a cell. So let me uh, illustrate this using a graph. So let's imagine this is a prokaryotic cell. They are usually easier to study because uh, their genetic material just lies nearly suspended in their cytoplasm. So let's start from the very basic and um, we have genes so each gene encodes a protein now a protein is an enzyme or a material that will allow cell to do some microbial activity so each of this gene in very literary terms right now we can express it as it's a sentence it's a command now these genes are woven together by this inter, inter, uh, intergenetic material into long chains of genetic material referred to as chromosome. So basically what we have is a chromosome is a sequence of genes separated by nucleic acids that do not necessarily code for a particular protein. And this genetic material of the cell usually contains all the essential information that a cell requires to grow and to live its life. Sometimes and very often in case of prokaryotes, microbes also have extra genetic material, extra chromosomal genetic material. Let us say this is a plasmid. Plasmid is a classical example of extra chromosomal genetic material. Now this chromosome remember is essential. So this is essential genetic material for the cell to grow. Plasmid might also carry some essential genetic material, but the beauty of plasmid is that since it is not part of chromosome, it is easy for the cell to reject the plasmid, throw it out of the uh, cell or share it with another microbial cell. So to recap, we have genes, each gene encodes for a particular pr uh, protein or part of a protein, usually a protein. These are genetic elements, plasmid, chromosome, these are genetic elements. Together, chromosome, plasmid and all other genetic material in the cell, together they are referred to as genome. So when we talk about human genome, we are not only talking about what is there in our chromosome, but we are also talking about the extra chromosomal genetic material present in human cells. So now let's go down and go down to the basic of what genes are, what DNA is, what these nucleic acids are, so that it's more clear to you. So uh, let's go down to the basic and look at what constitutes the genetic material. In this slide, we have four informational molecules attached to phosphate bond, uh, phosphate backbone: cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. Now, thymine, adenine, so guanine, and cytosine often abbreviated as ATGC form the basic alphabet of life. ATGC, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. These are found in uh, DNA because they are deoxyribonucleic acids. That is their chemistry by the way. And when we have RNA, the T is replaced by U. So we have AUGC. 
So for example, I ask you a question and I give uh, the question is that I give you two sequences and I ask you to determine which of these is DNA, which of these is RNA. What you need to do is look if it has T or U. If it has U, it is RNA. If it has T, it is DNA. Alrighty. So ATGC and AUGC. Now what do these ATGC and AUGC do? Usually these, 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 nu these are nucleosides and then they get attached to a phosphate backbone of DNA. Now here is the beauty, A will form bonds with T, these are weak hydrogen bonds. So if there is, this is let us say our genetic material, DNA because we are talking about T, so this is our DNA, one chain of one phosphate bond of DNA, backbone of DNA and there is an A attached to it, it will automatically try to attract a T to it and let us say here is another A, so we will have another T, here we have a G, now G makes three hydrogen bonds with C and let us say we have C here so it will attract a G. Now these also are attached to a phosphate backbone and together they make a DNA molecule. So this together they are um, DNA molecule, these are nucleosides and when they are attached to the phosphate backbone they are called as nucleotides. So in this figure you can note you see here that we have thymine, thymine is attached to the phosphate sugar backbone and by uh, and they are attached to another guanine molecule that is also attached to a backbone of nucleic acid. These two are attached to each other with a phosphodiester bond. Now because there is a thymine here it has a double bond with adenine and the guanine has a triple hydrogen bond with cytosine G with C, A with T. And now these nucleotides, the adenine and the cytosine are attached to each other by a phosphodiester bond. Now among ATGC or adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine, thymine and cytosine are pyrimidine and you can notice the uniqueness between thymine and cytosine, they both have single aromatic ring, single aromatic ring. There is some structural difference in both of them definitely. Now guanine and adenine are called purines and you can notice they have two aromatic rings, both of them, similar structure which is still distinct from each other. So we have adenine, guanine, purine, thymine, cytosine, pyrimidine. Now thymine is attached to this sugar and phosphate bond, this is phosphate, uh, phosphodiester bond and it is important to know that uh, the pent this is pentose sugar by the way. Now pentose sugar and nucleoside are attached by glycosidic bond and this is hydrogen bond. So there are three different bonds here that you must be aware of. So uh, going back here and trying to illustrate, this is what I want to, um, the message that I want you to remember, A, T, T, G, C, let us say this is the sequence of nucleoside, by themselves they are referred to as nucleoside. When they attach to a pentose sugar, and the diagram is there in the slide. The pentose sugar, so they are attached to pentose sugar, now they are called as nucleotides. These pentose sugar have phosphodiester bonds with them. So for phosphate diester, so they have a phosphate molecule connecting the pentose sugar. Now together they have made one chain, one half of the DNA. Now because it is a C, it will make triple bond with G, A will make double bond with T and so on and they are attached to another pentose sugar and the pentose sugar have phosphodiester bond between them. And this is called the phos uh, pentose, the sugar phosphate uh, bond, uh, backbone of DNA. Now you can notice that there are two chains going, this is a, these are usually very very long chains, very long up to million base pairs. By the way this unit is called base pair. What I just call nucleotide is called base pair. So we count them using base pairs. For example, how many base pairs do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this DNA, how long is it? It is 5 base pair long. So the unit of length of DNA for um, applied environmental microbiology is base pair. If I tell you I have sequences of um, that are 500 million base pair long, which is very long, then it means I have information about 500 million base pairs that are connected sequentially to each other. Alrighty. Now this is the central dogma of molecular biology that I promise we will be covering in this course. So we have DNA. Now um, let us take some time and understand about the structure of DNA. 
very generally. So, I told you that we have two backbones. So, this is one pentose phosphate backbone, this is another pentose phosphate backbone. They do not stay to each other like parallel strips. Instead, what they do is they twist around themselves and make what is called a double helix uh, structure. So, this is they are helically coiled around each other and this is the beauty of it. Even though these are hydrogen bonds here, which are very weak bonds in by their nature, because there are so many hydrogen bonds, the bonding between the both backbones is very strong just because of sheer number of hydrogen bonds that are present here. So, this is coiled like a double helix. The best way to imagine a double helix is imagine a stairwell coiling up and another stairwell coiling down. So, they are anti parallel to each other. And the way this anti parallel business works is for now, just to make it simple, we call one and five prime, another three. 3 prime. So, one strand runs 5 prime to 3 prime, the other strand runs 3 prime to 5 prime. So, DNA, this is DNA again reminding you. So, DNA is a double helically coiled structure with two uh, phosphopentose backbone and they have nucleosides that are attached to it and bond to each other such that T is always bonded to A and G is always bonded to C by double and triple bond. And they are anti parallel in sense that one runs from 3 prime to 5 prime, the other runs from 5 prime to 3 prime. And uh, briefly glancing the central dogma of molecular biology, this DNA that we just described here in detail is transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA. Now, what is transcription? DNA acts like the storage of information and the information has to be taken to other parts of the cell. So, the, all this is happening in the genetic material. Now, the cell, let us say the entire whiteboard is the cell. So, let us say here is a ribosome that needs a particular protein or the cell needs to make a particular protein. So, the message needs to reach the ribosome. So, the way it will work is this particular copy of DNA will be photocopied, will be replicated into a messenger RNA. Now, remember what I told you in the beginning because it is RNA instead of T it will have U. So, when a cell, a bacterial cell or um, even eukaryotic cell looks and finds that this genetic material has U, it knows that it is a message. It is a messenger RNA. So, because it is a message let us take action on it and then the cell might decide that mRNA can go where it needs to go and then the cell might decide to act on this message. So, this step where DNA is converted into RNA or messenger RNA is called transcription. And then the mRNA reaches the ribosome where uh, synergistic efforts of ribosome and other RNAs, transfer RNA and proteins together convert this messenger RNA, uh, use this messenger RNA as a template for making a new protein. So, remember central dogma of microbiology a molecular biology is we have DNA that encodes information. From this information we can make copies of genetic material called messenger RNA. This carry the information encoded in DNA and the messenger RNA can go to ribosome which can make protein using mRNA as a template. And it is a beautiful um, mechanism and I will be discussing more details about it as we go now. Uh, just basic information in eukaryotes usually we have one gene let us say from here to here it is one gene. Now, in eukaryotes this one gene will be converted into one mRNA, one messenger RNA. In prokaryote let us say this is one gene, this another gene here and there are four more genes in this side and two more genes on this side. Now, all these eight genes can be um, can be transcribed into a singular long mRNA. So, in prokaryotes you can see transcription can happen very fast and energetically very efficiently. Now, this mRNA um, goes to ribosome. Now, as I said ribosome uh, involves synergistic efforts of ribosome, proteins, translation factors, tRNA. So, here we have information saying that ribosome which, invo in which is constituted of proteins and rRNA, ribosomal RNA. It makes use of some transfer RNA or tRNA and translation factors to convert to create proteins using this as template. Uh, this is a very beautiful mechanism and I would like to uh, draw this and show it to you. So, now let us take an illustrative insight into the central dogma of molecular biology. So, as I said we have DNA. So, first we have DNA made of ATGC and a beautiful phosphate pentose backbone and hel double helically coiled antiviral cells to each other. Now, the DNA let us say the sequence of DNA looks like this. 
A T T A G C A T A and so on and so forth. Let's say this is an this is an extremely small gene that needs to be sent to some part of the um, cell so that action can be taken according to the information stored here. In a layman's term, I like to call DNA as the book in the library. So if there is a book in the library that has the information you, uh, is, that is needed in some part of the campus, your university campus for example, then first step is to go and find the book. So if, let's say I found the book and I know that this is the page, gene is the page that is important for you. This is the page that I need to uh, do the work that I need to do at some other part of the campus. So what uh, this is uh, what uh, the next step that will happen is called as transcription. So in transcription, the DNA is converted into RNA, messenger RNA and it is called messenger RNA because it carries a message to the cell that hey, this is the page you require and this is the page from the book that I got. I like to think of transcription as photocopying the page in the book. So let us imagine that um, you are sitting in your university campus and you find out that you need to make a septic tank because it is environmental microbiology, let us talk about septic tank. You need to make a septic tank and you do not have the information on how to make a septic tank. So what you can do is you can go to your library, find the right book that has information. So you find the right gene that has the information you require about how to make a septic tank. Then you can go to your photo photocopier and ask him to make photocopy of the pages that you require. This is transcription. So DNA is converted into messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA for this would look like A U U a G C A U A. So this has been converted into messenger RNA. Now this messenger RNA is shorter than the DNA, the entire gen uh, DNA genetic material and this can be uh, taken wherever you want it to t go. So now I take the photocopy of the pages that I require to make a septic tank and I can go to the site where I need to make a septic tank. So this will go to the site. Now in on the site we have civil engineers, we have architects for some reason, we have economists, we have uh, masons and we have uh, the um, construction project managers. So we have a group of people. Now in terms of molecular biology, this group of people are called as ribosome. So we have ribosome which is, a, which is an elegant structure of different kinds of RNA proteins and if you take a generic course in genetics, you will get to learn more about ribosome and I highly encourage it. It is very beautiful to learn about ribosome and it is a very, very important uh, part of cell. So this is where the meeting is going on, the meeting of construction project managers and um, the architects and the civil engineers for making your septic tank. In terms of molecular biology, this is where the action will start taking place. This is where your the copy that you have made from some pages of the book will be converted into action. So we here we have ribosome, we have translation factors, we have uh, tRNA or transfer RNA and we have loads of other proteins. Now what they do is they have received your message. This messenger RNA has gone here. They have re received a message and the let us bring message here now, A W. So they have received your messages, now they will read your message. So how does cell read the message? Usually every gene will have a start codon, so that says start, start reading message from here and it will have a stop codon that will say stop, stop reading message here. So wherever the ribosome and their ribosome and company finds the start codon, they start reading codon. Now here is the thing, in cell, cell reads in terms of three alphabets at a time. So it will read A U U A G C A U A. What it will do now is bring the TR translation factor and ribosome will stick here and they will read A U U. So when they have read A U U, the transfer RNA will bring the right amino acid that matches with A U U. Now I must pause here and introduce you with what this amino acid is and um, what this uh, tRNA is doing here. There are amino acids that join together with peptide bonds and make protein. Some of them are essential amino acids, some of them are non-essential but some of them can be created in our bodies, in our cells, some we need to acquire from environment. 
Now these amino acids, for each amino acid usually there is a unique codon and we will get there, I will show you the chart. There is a unique set of three um, nucleotides that say, okay, I want this amino acid. And what transfer RNA will do, when ribosome has read, oh, the code says AUU, then the transfer RNA that carries the right amino acid, which is encoded by AUU, will come here and will bring amino acid. And then when the ribosome proceeds further and reads AGC, another transfer RNA carrying the right amino acid that is encoded by AGC will bring the amino acid and they will join together by peptide bonds. In this way, they make long chains of amino acid. Now it's important to know that these long chains of amino acid are the action. This is the actual action that was encoded by your DNA in the first place. So now these proteins will do the work they need to do. They might catalyze a reaction, they might um, trigger some actions in the cell or improve the met or change the metabolism of the cell or whatever the function that is there of this protein. Now it is beautiful for me to just mention, um, I want to mention this beautiful aspect of proteins that it is not their chemistry per se, it is not okay protein 1, uh, amino acid 1 here and then we have amino acid 2 here and amino acid 3 here. It is not the sequence of amino acids like it is sequence of mRNA or sequence of nucleotides in DNA that governs the function of protein. It is their stereochemistry not just chemistry and I will talk about it soon. So here we have central dogma of molecular biology and these are some pictures, uh, beautiful cartoons showing what I just described to you on the board. So we have, okay, in central dogma the first step is DNA replication which is a step that I skipped. So in DNA replication if the cell wants to divide it can use topoisomerase which is a protein which breaks and uncoils the DNA and then when the coils of the DNA have been, uh, this, uh, have been separated, new uh, complementary uh, nucleotides can attach and make the complementary DNA chain. So in this case, in the, this purple backbone has been torn apart and when it was torn apart, you can see in this 5 prime end of this purple backbone, there was an A followed by G, then G and followed by C. So for an A, a T came and attached to it, then a C came and attached to it and then C came and attached to it and so and so forth and a complementary chain is being formed. And this job is done by DNA polymerase by the way. So this is the first step. If we want to replicate a cell, we do DNA replication. I don't need to go more in detail but you should know that DNA polymerase is at work. It is important to know because many chemicals stop the activity of DNA polymerase and the cells die. The second step is transcription. So here we have DNA, now we want to make messenger RNA. Now to make messenger RNA, topoisomerase will come and will uncoil the DNA. Uh, I must mention here that DNA can be very long. For a cell like E. coli, which is very, very tiny, its DNA can be up to 1.8 millimeter long. Now how would you pack such a long DNA in a, such a small cell? By supercoiling, which is the uh, this DNA is supercoiled to an extent that there is actually a lot of force, lot of tension stored in it. So topoisomerase, a very magnificent protein structure, will come here, uncoil it, and when it opens up a frag the required fragment of DNA, as shown in this part of the figure, complementary strands will come and uh, will be transcribed, and what we get is a beautiful uh, is a single stranded RNA. So remember, in DNA we have ATGC, in RNA we have AUGC. Now this messenger RNA will go to ribosome and this is the picture of ribosome here, this slight blue two circles. Now the ribosome will read the messenger RNA and it will read it in terms of three um, codes, three nucleotides, together they are referred to as codon. So first it read GUU here and the transfer RNA, this structure is of transfer RNA, the transfer RNA that carries a mirror image of GUU which is CAA and the right amino acid. So this black dot is the amino acid. So this right amino acid will come and attach to this and it will, the right amino acid will come and attach to the growing amino acid chain or the growing protein chain. This is transcription followed by translation and this amino acid is the enzyme required for the activity. So we can see here how the information converted into action and in the analogy that I was drawing about library, if this is the book in the library 
transcription is making a copy of a particular important page and then you take the page to where you where the action is happening and you convert that information in the page into activity which is routine okay um, so now you know three kinds of nucleic acids and I want to give you a quick glimpse on their properties. DNA if it is double stranded, so this is double stranded DNA right, two strands that are super coiled and helically arranged, uh, helically attached to each other. So this DNA is usually very long lasting unless there are specific enzymes that degrade DNA, the DNA can last very long. And um, there we have even managed to collect DNA from certain extinct animals that died a long long time ago. So you know DNA can last thousands and thousands of years. RNA on the other hand usually has a short life and you can see why. DNA needs to sit here forever and ever but RNA needs to be destroyed once the protein has been made. If let's say the RNA encodes for septic tank, well it won't but in human life it is it, let's say it encodes for septic tank. then. Unless we destroy this, people will continue making more and more septic tank. So in terms of molecular biology, RNA needs to have a particular life, lifespan. If it lives longer than its lifespan, then the same protein will be unnecessarily made wasting cells resources and also perhaps causing damage to the cell. On the other hand, if mRNA dies really fast, then the required action will not happen. Okay, now here I have a very interesting bullet point saying some virus violate the central dogma. Some viruses violate the central dogma because they skip the DNA step entirely. They just have RNA. These are RNA viruses and we will briefly go over them in the later chapters. And then the diversity among domains. Here I want to highlight the immense diversity in the ribosomes. So let us take a look here. In this picture we have bacterial ribosome, archaeal ribosome and eukaryotic ribosome. And um, picture suggests that the eukaryotic ribosomes are most complex in structure and bacterial ribosomes are simpler and have less components. What we notice is that the ribosome activity of archaea is usually the most simple compared to bacteria and eukary eukarya. In eukaryotic cells this entire activity that is um, done by ribosome which is of translation is actually of three different steps. So it takes three unique steps for eukarya to convert message into action, message into protein. Archaea usually has a simpler structure and bacterial ribosome has been very very useful for taxonomic classification which simply means giving bacteria a right name and knowing the bacteria that it is related to. So if I have an unidentified bacteria and I have the sequence of its ribosome because remember ribosome also has nucleic acids RNA. So if I have the sequence of RNA I can find out which other bacteria it is related to and not and we will talk about this in subsequent lectures. I have mentioned to you before that T and A bond to each other with double hydrogen bonds and guanine and cytosine with triple hydrogen bonds. Now this bonding can be very strong not because they are hydrogen bonds which are in general very weak bonds but because there are so many bonds, hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA. Now if we increase the temperature, now what happens when we increase the temperature students? When we increase the temperature, the, the energy of the heat can dismantle these bonds and what we get is denaturation which is the strands separate from each other. And um, today we will just finish our lecture at genetic elements and chromosome. This is the last slide of today's lecture and then tomorrow we will talk more in detail. So for today I want to just uh, remind, uh, make sure that you understand that these are very strong bonds between AT between the two strands of double stranded DNA, but they can be removed by denaturation. And everything else here I have already mentioned. So here we have a summary of the genetic elements that I talked about earlier in the class. So chromosome double stranded DNA, so it means it has two strands and usually found in prokaryotes, well prokaryotes is where chromosomes are very relevant. They are extremely long and when they are found in prokaryotes they are usually circular. So prokaryotic chromosome will be circular. So there will be no singular end. Unlike if chromosome is found in eukaryote, it will be linear. Still double stranded, but linear. Now plasmid is the extra chromosomal genetic material which is usually double stranded, can be circular, can be linear. It is found in all, but it is less common in eukaryotes. And this is extra chromosomal as in it is not part of the chromosome. They are usually shorter than chromosome, much shorter, can be circular or linear. 
Then we have transposable elements, they are found in all these, they are also uh, extra chromosomal, sorry, these are also genetic material. The difference between plasmid and transposable element is that transposable genetic element will enter the chromosome, unlike plasmid which stays away from chromosome. And then we have organeller genome, and uh, organeller genome is very relevant in eukaryotes. So, in eukaryotes, remember we have organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplast. Now, mitochondria and chloroplast have their own genetic material which resembles the genetic material of prokaryotes. This is known as organeller, organeller genome and this is usually medium length uh, compared to eukaryotic genetic material and circular and this is a similarity it shares, shares with prokaryotes. And then we have virus which can be single standard or double standard DNA or RNA, they are usually shorter circular or linear, there is a lot of diversity in viral genomes. So my dear friends, this is all for today. In next lecture, we will go ahead and revise, uh, briefly go through what we have talked today and proceed forward and dig into the more details of the central dogma of molecular biology. Thank you very much.